uh, welcome everyone to this um, the, to this uh, international technical webinar on homegrown school feeding. This uh, webinar is jointly organized uh, by the FAO eLearning Academy and WFB, and it is actually to launch uh, a, an e-learning course that is now available in English, French, and Spanish on homegrown mm -hmm. schools. So, uh, and we will be giving you the link later, uh, later in the presentation. So today for this launch, we have an extremely rich program. We have um, the honor of having with us um, various representatives from, uh, from FAO. So uh, we have the director of the nutrition division, Mrs. Anna Larte. We also have Carmen Burbano from uh, WFP. Uh, Florence Tartanac also, who's a nutrition officer. We have the honor of having with us uh, the ambassador of the African Union and NEPAD, uh, Mr. Habadou uh, Saha. We also have uh, representatives from IFAD, from the Imperial um, uh, College of London, and also from the Global Child Nutrition Foundation. So the, the program will be extremely rich and we, are, we will be trying to manage uh, all the different, um, the, the timing uh, during the, the, the speaker's presentations. I also wanted to mention that this is one of a series of uh, international technical webinars that are regularly being delivered uh, together with Agrinium and uh, the United Nations uh, Economic and Social Commission for the Pacific. So we regularly deliver these uh, webinars and you can have access to the recordings of the previous webinars directly on the FAO eLearning Academy in the section, uh, in the webinar section. So without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Anna Leitner, the, the director of the FAO Nutrition uh, Division. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Christina, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on homegrown school feeding program. This year has been an exceptional and challenging year for the entire world. COVID-19 has really challenged all of the world's systems, from transportation systems, banking systems, health systems, food systems, you name it. The interruptions to essential nutrition services by COVID is estimated to cost an additional 6.7 million wasted children on top of the pre-COVID number of 14.9 million. COVID has disrupted essential service to school children all over the world. Over 670 million children lost access to this essential school feeding program available to them. Disruptions in homegrown school feeding program did not only affect school children, but also a small, the smallholder farmers that supply the nutritious foods for keeping the system running. Going forward, we need to build resilience into the homegrown school feeding programs so that should such a pandemic happen in future, this valuable service to children and smallholders will be protected. FAO has been supporting homegrown school feeding program through the FAO School Food and Nutrition Approach, which provides a comprehensive framework to assist countries in the design, implementation of school food and nutrition policies and programs. The approach links healthy school meals, food and nutrition education, while building capacities for sustainable procurement and value chain development. Homegrown school feeding program can contribute to the achievement of several of the sustainable development goals. I list a few here. SDG one, low poverty, two, zero hunger, three, good health and well-being, four, equal op equality edu education, eight, decent work and economic development, economic growth, and 10, reduce inequalities. 
In terms of FAO's collaboration with the Rome-based agency, the Rome-based agencies have joined forces to create a resource framework for the design, implementation, and scale-up of country-led homegrown school feeding programs. This framework or this resource framework is aligned with the framework for the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting. Many governments are increasingly sourcing food for school feeding locally from school smallholder farmers. Homegrown school feeding programs uh, also provide economic benefits for local communities. Homegrown school feeding programs combine many opportunities, and I'll highlight a few. The education sector provides the infrastructure through which homegrown school feeding programs can function. In return, homegrown school feeding programs help children to gain access to, participate in, and benefit from school schooling. In the health and nutrition sector, homegrown school feeding programs uh, provide opportunities for important complementary services, including health and nutrition monitoring of children and vaccinations. The agriculture sector can provide supply side support in helping farmers and small local entrepreneurs to engage in formal markets. In return, homegrown school feeding programs can provide a stable demand for food production for producers as needed. Social protection programs can provide households with a livelihood support that enables their children to participate in school. In return, homegrown school feeding programs provide livelihood opportunities through demand and payment of services. Ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar will present the key elements of the homegrown school feeding program e-learning course, which aims to supports the planning, design, and implementation of such a program. We will also discuss the importance of partnerships as enablers of a successful homegrown school feeding program. On this note, I thank you for your participation. Christina, the floor is back to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Anna. And I would like now to give the floor to Mrs. Carver Burano, um, who, uh, will, who is the, the director of WFP's uh, school feeding division. So Carmen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, it's nice to be on the, on the screen with, uh, with all of the panelists. It's lovely to see you uh, even just on the camera, but it's nice to, to know that you're nearby. Although Arlene, I know you're very, very far away and it's very, very early for you. So welcome to all of you to this, uh, to this, uh, to this great webinar. I have the, the task to really introduce the topic of homegrown school feeding to in, in this meeting. And so let me, let me try and share my screen with you so I can share a presentation that, the, that we prepared. Can, we, can you confirm if you guys are seeing my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So um, my task really is to set us off with some common understanding of what we're talking about. I think many of the people that are joining this webinar probably are very familiar with homegrown school feeding. So my job is quite easy, but I do want to acknowledge that as we're launching this specific training uh, tool through our partnership with FAO and also in partnership with EFAD, with the Global Child Nutrition Foundation, with the Partnership for Child Development. Um, it is uh, a growing topic of conversation. I was actually just before joining this call in a call about uh, the preparations for the Global uh, Food Summit, for the Global Food Systems Summit of 2021. And the issue of homegrown school feeding and the fact that these programs are really food systems in and of themselves because they really look across the supply chain from the farmer to the consumer, which is the child and everything in between. It is really no surprise that they have been uh, so popularly accepted and adopted by governments around the world. So let me just start by perhaps just proposing a common definition. And of course, this is part of the resource framework that is the basis for this training. 
when we talk about homegrown school feeding programs, we really talk about um, programs that feed children in schools, but that use locally grown and procured commodities, food. And so that also translates into diverse and nutritious meals, and it supports resilience building in communities. So we can see the, the definition is quite um, interesting. It's quite broad. And perhaps I'll just stay here and unpack this a little bit. There are various ways of doing school feeding. Um, and we see many models around the world. And we always like to say there's no one size fits all approach. In several countries, there are many models within the same country. In some cases, it's really not possible to have local procurement of food because of the context. But in most of the countries that we know of, there is some uh, interest and in many countries, large scale implementation of programs that really make the effort to connect the production of smallholder farmers to the food that the children receive in school. And so that connection, that intention to connect farmers with children and with the food is what we call homegrown school feeding. Um, let me, um, let me move to a second slide to go a little bit deeper into some of the characteristics of these programs. As I was mentioning, the issue of local procurement is key, is you know, where and who produces the food and how that food is being procured that is really at the crux of all of this. Now, we've spent years discussing what local means, what, how local is local and, and whether local means next to the school, whether it means at the district level, whether local means within a country. And I think we've come to the conclusion that um, local is whatever it makes sense in that context. And the more local, the better, basically, if the trade-offs allow it. So this word is really meant to um, signify the intention that the food that is procured for these uh, programs be procured as, as close as possible to the beneficiaries, to the intended beneficiaries. But of course, there are trade-offs that we might understand, we must understand to be able to make sure these programs are effective and efficient. The second thing, of course, is that this is focused, these programs are focused not just on education, but also on the promotion of local agriculture. And here, the partnerships with ministries of agriculture, with so local associations, with local governments that are supporting the capacity of local associations is really important. So we're also talking about really important partnership, at least between education and agriculture, but the other third sector, which is really important is health. And how do we support that local agriculture is one of the primary preoccupations of programs that are, that are set up in this way. A really important beneficiary of these programs, if they are done in such a way that they are designed to benefit our smallholder farmers and traders. We're talking about um, a good understanding of the local food systems and the production systems in countries and being able to identify what those smallholder farmer and farmer associations need to be able to connect to that market which school feeding programs represent, which is really important. And then I've talked about the multi-sectoral approach um, a little bit in terms of the connections between the different uh, sectors. But one thing which is really important and I would say is at the base of a lot of the government uh, efforts around this is that this is really um, important in terms of government and local ownership, both of communities, local governments, but also um, a country as a whole and how these programs become more sustainable the more localized they are. And so um, that's another big characteristic of these programs. Okay, so it's also important to understand why we would care, you know, why go through the trouble of setting up an approach, which is a complex endeavor. It's not easy to deal with several pieces of the supply chain and several sectors, et cetera. There are many uh, reasons why we would do this, but one of them is, that in many low-income countries, um, there is a market problem. Uh, there's, there's production, especially through smallholder farmers in most of these low-income countries and in Africa specifically, a huge amount of that production is produced in smallholder farmer um, plots of land and also aggregated through associations, but there's a problem in terms of connection to markets. And school feeding programs represent an enormous market 
We know that around 400 million children receive food each year through national programs. If we multiply what each child eats per day and we multiply that by 400 million and we multiply that by 365 days or so, then we're talking about tons and tons and tons of food. So this is a very big market and um, it's also quite stable. So it's, 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 it's a, a good opportunity to make sure that there's an incentive for smallholder farmers to connect to that market. There's another really important reason why these programs are important. And that is because locally grown food is more closely um, associated with what children culturally are used to eating. It could be tailored to different regions of the country that have different cultural and nutrition patterns. Um, and children can learn to eat uh, in a context specific way what is grown locally in their regions. We were talking about promoting national ownership. It's very important um, to note that governments are very much interested in these programs because they support various parts of the economy. And as I was saying, it supports the agriculture side, the education side, social protection, and in general creates uh, human capital. And so it's also a really good opportunity to create intersectoral pr uh, programming and planning within the government, but also um, in local government structures. You have here some of the summaries in terms of what are the different benefits of a homegrown school feeding program. I won't go through all of them, but I think the point of this slide is to show how multiple benefits can be reaped from these programs, uh, basically reaching many, many, many SDGs uh, related to human capital, like education, nutrition, and health, but also resilience related to agriculture, community development, and in general, economic development for communities. So if we put in place all of these um, different benefits together, we really have quite a powerful safety net, which is, um, we think, one of the major reasons why governments decide to invest in these programs is really because of this, the multiplicity of these factors, uh, of these benefits that really um, come up with some sizable returns. We've been doing an analysis with Harvard University lately to quantify the results, uh, the, the benefits of school feeding. And for every dollar invested in school feeding, um, in homegrown school feeding, uh, we know that between 10 and $17 or so are, are put back in terms of productivity and dollars that are reinvested in the community. So this is a really good investment for governments, especially because of this multiplicity of benefits. Now, uh, that's the theory. The practice, of course, is a little bit more complicated and it's never very straightforward. We know that globally there's been a tendency over the last 20 years or so to transition towards more homegrown school feeding approaches through governments. This is in many cases uh, driven by political commitments. One of the very important uh, statements was uh, in 2004, for example, through NEPAD and the African Union that decided and committed to moving forward the idea of homegrown school feeding in the continent. And we know that that political commitment really sparked a huge movement within Africa. But we also see that in other continents, Brazil, for example, being a very good example of a country that has put in practice at scale these programs. So for example, in the 61 countries that WFP supports, 42 of them are implementing some form of a homegrown school feeding program. So this is quite an important scale. Um, and we know that about 80% of the food that is purchased uh, is purchased locally and a lot of it within the country. So these programs have achieved a certain amount of scale, uh, but um, there's still a lot to, to learn and a lot to think about in terms of the challenges that we're seeing governments um, uh, mulling over on the ground. So let me just share with you some of the challenges that we observe. Um, the scale up of these, of these experiences has been a challenge for a lot of governments. Uh, we see pilots being implemented in different parts of countries, but there's very few countries that have managed to scale this up to a government, a, a countrywide program um, of, 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 a, of an important scale. Of course, we have interesting exceptions to that. Nigeria, for example, Ghana, and I mentioned Brazil. So there are countries that have managed to really set this up and set their policy and legal frameworks to match 
what the um, the implementation looks like on the ground, but we do know that there are several challenges that need to be uh, brought to the table. There's an issue about resource availability. Um, uh, and now uh, in the wake of the COVID crisis, we know that there are uh, even more restrictions to access to resources from governments. Fiscal space is shrinking. And so um, this issue will always be a problem in many of the countries, especially the WFP supports. Um, sustainability issues and how we are collectively helping and supporting governments to make the decisions and make the political commitments, especially in the face of these shrinking budgets to prioritize these multi-sectoral programs. Now, very, very concretely, uh, we've seen throughout the, the period of the last two decades, one of the major issues with implementation of homegrown school feeding programs is the issue of food safety and quality because the lower the procurement is done, the closer to the schools, the more difficult it becomes to check and to be able to guarantee the safety and quality of that food. So that is a very big preoccupation that somehow we are working, um, all of us together, um, the, the organizers of this webinar, um, to really support governments and improve that, that issue. And um, issues around poor storage, um, especially uh, supporting smallholder farmers, make sure that the food isn't lost before it goes to the market and before it can be cooked in the schools is, is always a very important um, issue. And depending on the context, I'll add another one, depending on the context, these programs of course have several trade-offs. And we also know that one of the preconditions for these programs is that there has to be some sort of stability in the context. So countries that are dealing with conflict, countries that are dealing with a lot of instability have problems implementing a program that really requires um, a bit of a stable context in which different actors can really work together. COVID has brought its own uh, slew of, of problems, not just for this particular conversation, but as we all know, it has affected all of us in our lives. But specifically on this topic, uh, logistics has become uh, more complicated as movements are restricted. We know this, for example, from experiences we're hearing from Honduras, um, that uh, as, as lockdowns happen, uh, the issue of uh, movements of uh, uh, basically supply chains are being affected. Uh, we are seeing disruptions to markets affecting prices, affecting farm inputs and different types of um, uh, inputs that these programs require to be able to be successful and that's another um, and that's another issue but we do know um, and we do have several experiences and examples of governments and partners that have redesigned the programs thought about uh, how to work through these issues and come out the other side with programs that are more resilient to these kinds of shocks let me just end with a couple of opportunities because this is a really important platform uh, to broaden partnerships. And I think this webinar, the training module that has been put together is a really important example of how different organizations have come together to support governments in what is a really um, valuable multi-sectoral platform. Um, it also is a really uh, a good vehicle to enhance resource mobilization from the private sector, from communities, that see themselves as beneficiaries to the economic benefits that programs of this nature um, uh, um, provide. There's uh, an enormous amount of support for these programs. In 2016, the African Union, um, uh, um, the, the heads of state of the African Union committed to prioritizing homegrown school feeding for the continent. We see Africa really as, the, as a leader in, in political commitment in these, in these programs, but this is also happening in other, in other regions of the world. And there is opportunity to leverage that political commitment and, and increasing political will. Um, there is also a, a, a lot of different organizations that, incre that are increasing the knowledge that we have of these programs. And I have to say, I've been involved in homegrown school feeding uh, in one way or another for the last 15 years. And our knowledge of these 
uh, of these particular interventions at the country level has increased enormously through the, the collaboration of the partners in, the, in this webinar. So we know much more today about the trade-offs, about the challenges, and we can provide a lot of the technical assistance that has been actually uh, culminating into the resource framework that we, uh, that we have as the basis for this online training. And um, an, uh, two more really important um, opportunities now and moving forward, uh, the opportunity really to look at how to enhance intersectoral approaches and really linking different activities, not just homegrown school feeding, but also livelihood approaches, food security programs, school health and nutrition programs to not just enhance the access to farmers and support farmers, but also the nutrition and the health services that children receive in school. And again, we always talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic and COVID as of course presenting a challenge for us, but it is also an opportunity to look at the programs that are being implemented by governments at the moment and how we can collectively support them to um, um, make the best use out of those resources by benefiting the most amount of beneficiaries as possible. Thank you so much, Christina. And I look forward to the rest of the, of the, of the webinar. Thank you, Ter thank you very much for this excellent presentation on, on the basic concepts, principles, uh, and the importance and also the, the, the challenges and opportunities uh, related to homegrown school feeding uh, programs. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, since, um, since the African Union and, and NEPAD is one of our partners in, in this initiative and also in the design and development of the e-learning of the e courses, I would like to give the floor to Haladou Salha, who is the ambassador of the African Union and, and NEPAD. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to join this uh, webinar because it's talking about uh, an important key issue, which is of interest to all African countries. And as stated by my, previous, my predecessor, of course, uh, there is, uh, I may say, a very encouraging type of alliance around this uh, important issue. I think, uh, as it was said, homegrown school feeding is by its nature and concept should be, of course, a country-led multi-partner alliance initiative when the country government in the driving seat. So moreover, the key principles applying to this great initiative are leadership and ownership by the government. This to be translated, of course, into firm and long-term commitment in terms of resources. The resources uh, meaning, of course, finance, logistic, human expertise, but also institutional coordination. So this is why I may say the role of the government should be as follows. First, a very clear and constant briefing to the local communities, meaning agricultural producers in the country of targeted uh, schools and who also are the parents of the students to development partners, to the domestic private sector, but also to other stakeholders on the rationale behind the homegrown school feeding program. The government of course should create the enabling environment by mainstreaming the homegrown school feeding program into existing national agriculture and nutrition and food security investment plan. And uh, we are happy that uh, based on the CADAP implementation process, most of the African countries have already their national investment plan ready. And we are now implementing the second phase of this implementation process. Thirdly, we may need to establish a formal alliance, a type of agreement with the coordination mechanism. So, of course, in most of the countries, we have different type of school feeding activities, but if we want to implement a homegrown school feeding program, there is a need to have a well-defined formal alliance. On the other hand, as I said, for the government, we need a high political will 
by adopting, if necessary, and I think it's required, a legislative uh, text to be sure that we have the subsequent regular financial resources to be allocated to this program. And in particular, here we have a key role of the parliament because uh, the parliament being the representatives of the parents or the students, but also those who are the spokespeople from the those who are living on the ground. So they have also their role to play. So we need in terms of advocacy, but also in terms of commitment to have the parliament playing a key role. Furthermore, the government should assist in building institutional and technical capacity of the smallholder farmers to enable them to become reliable and competitive entrepreneurs and partners. Because as said previously in the presentation that we have been listening to, the smallholder farmers being in Africa, I may say the bulk of the main investors in the agriculture sector, they may need to have really a strong support in terms of institutional capacity to be sure that there will be really reliable alliance for this program. Furthermore, as I said, we have a very different type of school activities. If you have, if we need to have a homegrown school feeding activity in the country, the government should undertake a coherent and progressive harmonization of school feeding relating activities across and among global partners working in school feeding in a given country in order, if so required, to align to the concept of a real homegrown school feeding program. The government should pursue also mobilizing further resources combined with slowly increasing contribution from local community because as I said at the very beginning, the ownership should be in the hands of the local community because they are the parents or the children but they are also those who will be benefiting from this uh, school feeding program. So they should be involved at the very beginning of the initiative. And we should try to ensure that they will be contributing regularly in terms of maybe in kind contribution, but also later on when, wherever is possible, a kind of financial contribution if possible. We have also the government to pursue, if possible, to mobilize the buying in of domestic private sector, in particular those who are working in this sector, because when we have to proceed with the implementation of the homegrown school feeding activity, in particular when we are talking about uh, food processing, but also food purchase, food transport, food storage, you have the domestic private sector who will be involved. So I think we have also the government to sensitize and mobilize this the domestic private sector to buy in and to contribute to the financing of the homegrown school feeding activity. So at least, at, I may say at the end, the government should undertake regular monitoring and evaluation to measure the level of accountability of all stakeholders because in terms of contribution to the homegrown school feeding activity, what is very important is to have predictable resources. Therefore, if we have the alliance that I mentioned at the very beginning, we have to be sure that all stakeholders who are committed should of course allocate the resources on time and to be sure also that uh, when we have to undertake the evaluation to be sure that each of them have been meeting their commitments. So these are the key, let's say, roles for the government, because as I said, the homegrown school feeding activity should be coordinated by the government of a given country. This is why I think it's first a policy decision, but also a political will in a given country. So thank you very much for the time being, up to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador, for underlying the importance of multi-stakeholders' contribution to, 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 to these programs and also the potential role of parliamentarians. Thank you very much.
I would like to give the floor now to my colleague, uh, Florence Tartanac, who is a nutrition officer in FAO. Florence, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christina. And thank you very much for all the colleagues. It's really a pleasure to have all of you here because uh, it's a journey that we, we started uh, some time ago, three years ago, actually, with uh, uh, the, at the initiative of uh, WFP to start uh, this uh, resource framework and uh, to put together this, uh, this group and this partnership. No? So in, in, uh, in 2017, we, we were, uh, so WFP for sure, uh, FAO, uh, the Global Child Nutrition Foundation, and the Partnership for Child Development, PCD, and, and uh, IFAD uh, and NEPAD. So we are all here together to present uh, the result of this uh, work. First, uh, with um, the preparation of the resource framework uh, itself. So the resource framework is a knowledge product that tries to harmonize uh, all the existing knowledge and tools and uh, also build on the wealth of expertise of all these partners. And they, it, it's, it was very interesting for that. It also fosters the partnerships to help government no, to achieve their goals and lay the ground for uh, a community of practice on homegrown uh, school feeding for achieving uh, impact at scale. So I will uh, give like a journey through, through the e-learning course. Uh, uh, this e-learning course is uh, uh, on uh, the platform of uh, FAO, but also on the platform of WFP. And uh, uh, I, not sure maybe the other partners could confirm, but it, it should be also on the platform for any of the partners involved. And it's a course that is uh, of free access and you just need to, to register in the website to, to access the, to it. Uh, and uh, it is targeted to, to be used by uh, gov uh, program uh, practitioners in countries, uh, policy makers, uh, development uh, partners, governments, civil society, and also community-based organization and private sector. So everybody that is interested and involved in this kind of programs uh, can take it and uh, can benefit uh, from it. Uh, so the e-learning, as I said, is based on uh, the resource framework on two, uh, two documents, a technical document, which is quite detailed and, and big, and a, a synopsis. And uh, as uh, explained by Carmen, uh, there are already a number of innovative approaches not to homegrown school feeding in the world, but has been success successfully tested and implemented in various countries and also at different stages of the pro programming and implementation cycle. So the, this program, this training and, and the resource framework is based on this experience and is trying to document uh, the experiences also to, to give, uh, to leverage uh, and ensure impact at scale in line with the targets of uh, the 2030 agenda. And uh, so depending on the context, uh, we may require this systematic approach to uh, um, particular challenges. So how to develop a new uh, on-ground school feeding program, for example, or how to design it, how to implement it in a way that allows scale up, how to bring a successful on-ground school feeding pilot program to scale. So, there are different situations where we could uh, uh, adapt and see what could be useful for each, uh, each uh, participant um, to, to see the part that, that they need and they can be uh, um, using. So the, the four modules of the e-learning uh, lay the ground for approaches that support the establishment uh, of uh, and scale up of homegrown school feeding programs and provide a basis for uh, um, partnerships for investment, technical assistance, policy dialogue and learning at local, national and global levels. 
So I, I will not uh, go back to the definition of homegrown school feeding because uh, Carmen did it already very well and uh, she explained very well uh, how we managed to harmonize the, uh, the different concept and establish some kind of common understanding of uh, homegrown school feeding. And uh, so uh, this resource framework also managed to do that. We, we had uh, a lot of discussion at the beginning about, about this concept and uh, we managed to, to agree on them. And, and this uh, resource framework and e-learning are based on, on this discussion and this, uh, this agreement. Um, so uh, as also uh, Carmen explained very well, uh, we can see uh, all the um, benefits and multiple benefits uh, of uh, homegrown school feeding for different uh, groups and uh, sectors. Uh, mainly for smallholder farmers, but uh, also different uh, stakeholders along the value chain. And uh, in uh, many contexts, small family farmers and entrepreneurs are uh, poor rural actors who may benefit greatly, greatly from uh, homegrown school feeding market opportunities, including through increased uh, turnover and profit. And in addition, depending on the local cultural context, or small, small traders, small processors, uh, small and medium rural enterprises, uh, often uh, run by women, uh, are important. And they can uh, uh, promote increase uh, also gender equity, you know, this kind of program. So it's important to, to, to look at them uh, with this uh, holistic uh, approach. And it's also what the course is doing. So the, the first lesson was on the definition and uh, under, what understanding of the, the kind of program. And then the second lesson is going into the, the planning and uh, uh, how um, it focuses on two main uh, preparatory steps uh, required uh, for planning sustainable and effective uh, programs that respond to the need of the population and take uh, into consideration the priorities and capacities of the government. So first, uh, they need a long-term vision and political commitment. This was also highlighted by uh, Mr. Aladou Salah about uh, the, the very important uh, um, um, aspect, no? the, the political commitment, and also defining the broad and long-term changes uh, that stakeholders and particularly the government aim to achieve with homegrown school feeding. It's, it's a really a long-term uh, kind of program. No, you cannot just uh, have uh, this kind of program for short, uh, short period. So it's important to have this in mind. And it's also important to adequate and precise a context analysis and assessment because each situation is, is different. So we really need to explore the needs that can be addressed by homegrown in the country and developing an understanding of the different existing environments and opportunities that can support this uh, vision. So the course going to much uh, uh, details about uh, how to, to plan uh, this, this kind of program and uh, how to, to uh, fully take into account the, the national context. So we, we talk about the vision and political commitment and all the context analysis uh, looking at need assessment, local food system, e and existing uh, national capacities where you, we can really um, uh, take them into account and uh, plan the best uh, program possible. Then we are moving to uh, uh, the designing and implementing of the programs and uh, uh, the um, so it's very important to, to translate uh, the outcomes uh, of all the assessment and discussion into clear goals, objectives, and institutional implementation arrangement for the program to really uh, have the main aim of maximizing the program benefits while maintaining cost and risk, risk at manageable levels. No? Implementing, it's, it's really a, a challenge as uh, Carmen explained it. And uh, so we are looking at the different uh, ways of doing it. And uh, uh, as we said, it's uh, really depending on the context and, um, 
but uh, the strategy also can be integrated into broader strategic document and policy for school feeding and uh, as well as can be standalone uh, instrument so it's it, it's it's very also um, um, uh, it's possible to adapt it to the to, to the different situations and uh, a stage of the programs also, we are looking at the key factors uh, that are uh, behind the implementation and designing of, of the program. So we, we already talked about the key role of the governments and how the, the uh, look, not only the, the national government, but also the local governments in, in most of the countries, uh, this program are quite uh, decentralized. And also the importance of the strategy that is behind it and that can uh, change uh, greatly. Finally, uh, we are uh, no, no, so we are still looking at the designing and implementing uh, the program and the different uh, uh, stages and the component of it. So we have to define uh, the program objectives, the min menu design, which is very important ensuring food quality, uh, food safety and quality. This was also uh, mentioned by Carmen. Uh, linking smallholder farmers and local actors to schools or so looking at uh, the whole uh, value chain behind uh, uh, the schools to, to, uh, to ensure the supply. Also addressing uh, gender, and uh, this is very important uh, in, in particular for this kind of program as women have a very important role in both the supply, but also in uh, uh, being at, uh, helping at the school level. Uh, we have to maximize the synergies between the different programs, not only school feeding programs, but also, for example, in FAO or IFAD with uh, agricultural program when we are supporting small farmers uh, to, to improve uh, production. So this is important to link these programs to, to homegrown school feeding and also building an enabling environment to, to have all the pieces uh, together. And finally, so, so the last lesson, we, we look at uh, how to monitor uh, and evaluate this program. It is important to have this component in place while most of these programs are funded by governments and governments need to, to um, to report uh, to the governing uh, institutions uh, to and to to be transparent and uh, uh, responsible for to what what they are doing so really reliable and timely uh, monitoring and reporting are essential for ensuring the efficiency effectiveness and sustainability of the program and also good monitoring and reporting serve to ensure accountability of the use of resources and also learning in order to inform targeting and management decision and continuous improvement in the efficiency uh, and effectiveness of the program. And also, obviously, uh, generation of evidence about the achievements and uh, which forms of uh, the basis for success, successful sustainable resource mobilization. Um, and uh, yes, also component of the monitoring and evaluation and how to, to look at them uh, uh, in a, a sustainable way to, to have this uh, accountability and the, the use of resources. So the e-learning is, as I was saying, is available for everybody. We also have a, a, um, an innovative feature recently added in the FAO e-learning academy, which is a digital uh, badge uh, certifications, which uh, so at the end of the course, you, you can uh, have, uh, you can take, if you're interested in the final evaluation exam, and you will be provided with a digital badge certification. And uh, these digital ba badges are online visual representation of learned skills and achievement uh, and in learning environment. So they are already have been adopted by uh, a wide range of uh, sectors in uh, the uh, learning uh, environment. And they are being used to recognize both accredited and non-accredited learning in formal, informal, and non-formal settings. 
And as uh, Christina also announced at the beginning, uh, so now the e-learning and also re the resource frameworks actually are available not only in English, but also in Spanish and French. So here you can have the direct link. So this will be circulated after the, the event, not the webinar. So direct links to the e-learning in the different languages. And if you need more details and information, we have also uh, the technical uh, um, document of the resource framework, uh, also in the free languages, uh, uh, thanks to, to WFP contribution for the translation uh, into French and Spanish and uh, for both uh, the resource framework and uh, the e-learning. Thank, Thank you. you thank you thank you florence thank you very much for for the the detailed presentation of the of the e-learning course um i will be giving a, a little bit more details uh, afterward afterwards when, before we conclude uh, for the participants just for them to know uh, the all the presentations and all the links will be uh, provided uh, through the FAO e-learning uh, academies uh, on the webinar section you have all the you can download all the materials even the recording of, of this of this uh, webinar uh, so now I would like to give the floor to our colleague from IFAD uh, Joyce Njoro uh, Joyce the floor is yours thank you very much Christina and thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be in this webinar today to also share the experiences from IFAD and I would like to start by uh, following up from what Carmen talked about. She said there are several benefits of uh, homegrown school feeding. Uh, and, uh, and I'll basically be looking at the benefits of the smallholder farmers. So the, the, home, the homegrown school feeding initiative provides an excellent opportunity for collaboration. And in particular for Rome-based agencies collaboration because it enables the three agencies to come in within their comparative advantages and complementary actions towards achieving uh, a number of targets which are related to food and nutrition security. The comparative advantage of IFAD is that it links its, its investments projects which address ballholder farmers production and market constraints with schools serving as a potential market for their produce. So it is therefore an opportunity to help smallholder farmers to also access public purchasing programs, or in other words, institutional, institutional pro pro procurement, which are otherwise more likely to be exploited by large scale farmers or by or through imports. So the key entry points of interest of IFAD would include also nutrition sensitive value chains, which also create linkages from the farm to the school and uh, to school meals. So the, the home, homegrown school feeding also provides an opportunity to improve community engagement and organizational capacity building of smallholder farmers, bucket access and increasing income. And this is particularly important to note because there are schools almost everywhere, including in marginal areas. So there is a, is a, is a big potential market that is yet to be fully exploited. The, the integrated school meal programs may therefore open also new prospects of relevance to IFAD's rural transformation agenda that includes promotion of youth empowerment of women, promoting resilience and nutrition of the rural people. And the IFAD looks at the home, homegrown school feeding holistically along agricultural value chains and within the food systems approach. So I'll share uh, one example uh, of a project in Burundi and this is a value chain development program, which was designed in 2016 and ends in 2022. It has a target beneficiaries of 5,341 households. And the main objective of this project was to promote increases in incomes and improvements in food security for poor households in the program area. And the specific objectives here was to increase physical productive capital by building the resilience of production systems to climate change, and also intensifying crop and livestock farming to improve nutritional status and ultimately structure the milk and rice value chains, which are also linked to, to, to schools. 
Then the third one was to promote youth employment and strengthen capacity of actors. So this project is a collaboration between uh, the three Rome-based agencies, FAO and WFP, uh, and also together with the private sector, working collectively along the milk value chain uh, to provide milk in school meals. So the, the, the three agencies had different roles. So if I provided farmers with the cows, about 3,000 and training with relevant inputs, also including improved animal husbandry practices, and also supported the establishment of local milk collection centers, which aggregate milk from 12 farmer cooperatives, which were also established through the project. And from there, the milk is transported to the main collection center, where the milk quality is tested and stored. And this is where the linkage now to the private sector comes in. So the modern dairy uh, from Burundi collects the milk from the main collection centers and transports it to the factory where it is processed. So then from, the, from there, then the milk is distributed now to, to schools. It's procured by WFP. So WFP, uh, and, and it is integrated into the other school meals program, uh, ongoing school meals program and uh, it's targeting children from grade one to grade five. And then FAO is supporting the production of a quality animal feed, uh, which is produced by a feed processing unit. So what, what have we seen so far from this? Um, so, and, and, and uh, apart from the fact that the, the milk, I mean, is, is reaching the children, uh, and each of them, I think almost daily, they are getting about a quarter liter of milk per child per day in grade one to five. The other benefits also is that it has created 622 or more sustainable jobs for young people. And also like, also that that's, that's jobs, but then there are also other micro enterprises that have also come up and benefiting more than 2000 young people, both Men and men and women, boys and girls, or men and women, and uh, because the the program was was designed on a pass pass on uh, kind of a strategy, so the three thousand cows that started the program now we have five thousand five hundred seventy seven households which are benefited from these animals, and this generating annual increase in milk production and also income to these households, and then. Women have also organized themselves now that they are getting money from, the, from this enterprise into associations and savings and credit schemes. And through this, they have diversified their investments. And now they don't only keep cattle, but then they have also now pigs, they have livestock, and they, have, they are also growing vegetables and many other kind of uh, uh, activities uh, that have expanded just from that one, uh, one investment. And then also there are many other businesses that have mushroomed also kind of along the value chain. Uh, so, the, and, and this includes uh, production of fodder and selling of fodder, food processing like cheese and yogurt, milk bars, a lot of other many, many little, little uh, kind of uh, businesses which are benefiting both the young people and also the women. And then one other thing that maybe has also come up is that the care practices to children have improved. Uh, at least they say that they have more money, so they are paying school fees, they are buying food, they are building houses, and even procuring small pieces of land which they use for farming and other other purposes. So this this so in a nutshell, uh, what I just wanted to show you is that only one line of uh, benefits when it comes to the homegrown school feeding. And without even going to the other many benefits that we know from, from the children who are benefiting from this. But uh, this is what I wanted to share with you for today. Thank Thanks, you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce, also for underlying the importance of adopting uh, an integrated and holistic approach and also uh, the importance of collaboration in these types of program. I would like now to give the floor to Arlene uh, Mitchell, who is the executive director of the Global Child Nutrition Foundation, which is one of our partners also in the design and development of the e-learning course. So Arlene, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, 
I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about partnerships and uh, partnerships in homegrown school feeding in particular. There are three pieces of partnerships that I wanna talk about. And the first one is that partnerships can help to mobilize resources for successful program implementation. This slide is taken directly from the homegrown school feeding resource framework. And if you can see at the top of the, of the slide in the lighter green, it talks about school feeding and benefits to children, households, and governments. If you add smallholder farmers and homegrown to your school feeding program, you see at the, at the bottom of the slide that you expand the number of uh, actors that are benefiting from um, their home. Sorry, Arlen, Arlen, can you please yes. share the screens, please? Because we can't see the screen. Can you please click on, on share so we, can, uh, so we can also visualize the screens? Yes, I'm sorry, just a moment. Thank you. Here. And now, Excellent. yeah, you can see it, but I can't. So just give me one sec here. There we go. Yes, perfect. And slideshow. Yes. <laughs> From beginning. There we go. Sorry. So at the, at the top of the slide, as I mentioned, just, just children, households, and governments uh, are the key beneficiaries when you implement a school meal program. But when you add farmers in and turn the program into a homegrown school feeding program, you uh, reach an additional set of uh, beneficiaries. And this slide shows on the right-hand side shows very clearly the types of benefits that come to each of those uh, 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 players in the homegrown school feeding program. Another slide from the homegrown school feeding uh, resource framework shows how the, the benefits could go both ways. It isn't just the, the, um, the children and the, and the government and the farmers benefiting, for example, it, it, it benefits the program as well. The third slide is a, is a pictograph of bringing all of these stakeholders together sustainably. And this is where the real potential starts to pull together. In any given country, in any given homegrown school meal program, you can start to identify these stakeholders that can be important to your program, who can help to bring resources into the program, who can help to bring technical expertise into the program. Um, and as you can see, um, you can reach from the core beneficiaries, the, the core of the program is to help students and their families, but you can start to build your, your program to include all of these players or all of those players in this pictograph that are, are important to your program to, um, to both identify resources and also to, um, to find benefits for them and for the program. So we encourage people to, to consider all of these types of players as relevant to your country and as relevant to your program and think about these different layers of input and benefits that can come from your program to establish, to start to build the kinds of partnerships that will link to uh, sustainability. So the first, uh, pillar of partnerships, I think, is this mobilizing resources for mutual benefit. The second pillar is program sustainability, which is a major issue for all development programs. Some characteristics of sustainable programs include things like uh, clear goals and transparent targeting, um, 
political will, fi financial base. Uh, particularly, we find that having, as, as Hallidou mentioned, having a, a budget the ring fenced for uh, homegrown school feeding is extremely important. But highlighted here is the number of partners that you engage in the program and uh, as relevant to your program and as the program develops, meaningful win-win involvement of those stakeholders is really important to the sustainability of your program. Some examples of, of some uh, sustained school meal programs around the world are, uh, they're just numerous, but almost all of these uh, are homegrown in some sense of the word. Um, some of them preceded the terminology that we now use of homegrown, but where farmers have been involved, uh, local farmers building the local agricultural uh, support for your program, as well as, as ensuring uh, good nutrition for, the, for, for children. So each one of these um, programs, and we've been studying um, all large scale programs in the world. Uh, we've just conducted a survey of the 85, uh, 85 countries with large scale programs. And we can see in each one of those that has sustained over a period of time that it has involved a unique set of partnerships that evolve uh, from, from the outset of the program to, to the long-term uh, partnerships to keep the program going. And, and each one of these countries has its unique set of partnerships um, that have helped in some way of keeping the program going and all of them involve local purchase in, in one form or another. So um, the last part of, that I want to mention about partnerships is that I believe that it helps to establish long-term friendships. It's personally rewarding. And I say that because as I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking about when did I meet Haladu Sala? Well, it was over 20 years ago. When did I meet Leslie Drake? 20 years ago. Uh, Florence, I've known you for a long time. Carmen, the same thing. And in working on the homegrown school feeding uh, framework together, we got to bring together the collective wisdom, um, political commitment, uh, technical expertise of all of these players. And it was an extremely exciting uh, process. It was difficult at times, partnerships are difficult. Um, we had a few arguments here and there, but overall, we had a very successful partnership that continues um, through today. The last thing that I want to leave you with is um, a, a, an activity that GCNF has been um, managing for 22 years. This year is the 22nd year, which is called the Global Child Nutrition Forum. And this is a a chance for anyone in the world to, um, to join with other school feeding players and stakeholders, learn more about uh, school feeding, particularly homegrown school feeding, share their experience, learn from one another, et cetera. This year, the Global Child Nutrition Forum will be um, virtual. Uh, we won't be able to meet together but we welcome you all. It starts on October 26th, so next, next week. Um, and you can uh, attend uh, for free. Just go to gcnf2020.org um, or go to our website, gcnf.org and learn more about the forum. And we would love to see you there. We'll talk more about homegrown school feeding at that point. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlene, for underlying the importance of collaboration to generate uh, quality outcomes and also a greater impact. Thank you. I would like now to give the floor to Leslie Drake, who is the executive director of the Partnership for Child Development uh, in the Imperial, uh, Imperial College uh, of London. Uh, Leslie, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Thank you, Christina. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, great. Excellent. So I come into this conversation um, finding that I'm, I'm singing to the whole hymn sheet. Everyone seems to think that homegrown school feeding is the bee's knees. We're all partners together, everything moving forward. What you've asked me to talk to you about today is about operate, operate putting things in, into operations. Uh, how do we take all of this technical, um, theoretical piece and make it happen in the countries? And I think that's really happening. And as Arlene was saying, it's happening because we're in partnerships together. And the key thing that we've been working on for several years um, is working with the governments uh, to look at what they want to do and how do we bring the technical piece into that. And if you look at the, the piece that you want to talk uh, from me about is the menu planner. The menu planner is something that Imperial College brings to the table in terms of bringing the evidence base to policy decision-making, programmatic decision-making. And if you, I, I've just done some quick calculations and I see that over 20 million kids have now benef benefited from the school meals planner in Sub-Saharan Africa, just because we're looking at what's local, how do we connect with the smallholder farmers? How do we connect with the teachers? How do we communicate with parents? How do we communicate with pupils? And what we're finding is that we have this menu planner, which, which shows what the, the, if we look at UN decisions about 30% RDA for a, a school lunch, uh, and how, how we can use that from local produce uh, differs across countries, but the framework is solid and they like it because it's solid and it's from the WFP and the FAO. Now, if you look at what's, what's going on here, you, you see that it's not just about menu planning in terms of smallholder farmers knowing what produce they need. It's about trying to operationalize that. And for example, what do I, what do I understand what, for a hundred kilograms of rice? What does that mean? But if you put it in a handy measure, for example, it means this bucket that you can buy down the, 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 the market in, downtown Nigeria, it, this is what's gonna feed X number of kids. So the smallholder, uh, smallholder farmers, the cooks, everyone understands the chain. And so <clears throat> if we have menus from Monday to Friday, and we're, look, we're using all of the, we're, we're looking to, provide evidence to the governments to why they should be looking at this. Why should it be domestically financed? What are the impacts on, on education, health and nutrition if you feed children in schools? Is it getting the kids back into schools, not just the females, but the males? And are they learning better? The evidence is yes, they are. And this is how we can do this locally. This is how we can promote rural economies. This is how we can get the, 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 the smallholder farmers to get their kids back into school. And so one of the things that we've been working on from our side is in terms of building, the opera, building this into operations. So let's take it from, you know, here's a nice theory, here's a nice model, here's a nice construct. What does that mean on the ground? And so what, what I'm seeing, as I say, there's, you know, there's millions of kids now benefiting from the, these studies. And it's not perfect, but it, it's about, you know, what works contextually. What, as Arlene was saying, it's all about context. And so how, how do we engage with the local governors? How do we engage with the local 
um, community uh, services. How do we engage with the, 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 the parents and the kids? Because one of the important things that I've seen with this menu planner is that it's not just an instruction to the, the farmers about how much they can get from X kilos of. It's not about teachers knowing what the menus look like from Monday to Friday. It's actually about the kids taking this on and they're saying, oh, mom, they're taking this home. They're, they're saying, I'm not getting enough of, of this gingerbread piece of, of my menu, of, of my, my daily nutrition benefit and then the parents are coming back to the to to the the parent uh, to the community uh, to the education community saying okay there's something here we need to check we, we need to work on this how how do we do this and so i think it's not just about the the evidence it's about the operate uh, uh, how do we operationalize this and I think that's what the success that we've seen in terms of it, it's not perfect, but in terms of what we're doing in sub-Saharan Africa, we're actually reaching kids and they're getting a daily meal that's nutritionally balanced and using local foods, which mm -hmm. I think is a key thing. So I could harp on about this forever, but I think that all of the, the colleagues before me have, have we've all been saying the same thing that there is food out there we just need to be a bit more organized about how we how we manage it and this menu planner is one one way that we're we've seen that we see and to be done doing that Over. okay thank you thank you very much leslie about the um Thank you very much for describing the entire process and the importance of the, the taking into consideration the context in, in implementation. Thank you. I would like now to uh, open the floor to the question and answer um, session and um, where uh, ba basically Fabio will be sharing uh, with us the main uh, uh, questions that were uh, asked by participants. And I'd like to take this opportunity to um, come back to the different um, links so that here you can see the, the, the links that bring you directly to the different versions, uh, language versions of the, of the home uh, grown school feeding uh, course, e-learning course, and also to come back on the idea that now you can get a certification through the digital badge uh, system. So uh, this is possible uh, because uh, we, uh, we have added at the end a scenario-based, um, competency-based final test uh, that allows them to earn this digital badge, which is not just a, a certificate of completion, it is a certificate of acquisition of competences. So uh, this, um, it has, um, and it can then follow you uh, as part of your professional profile, it can follow you in your LinkedIn, in your e-portfolio, in your CV, it really certifies the, the pool of competences that you have acquired. We have also added here on the screen a number of other uh, nutrition related courses that could be of interest. And uh, uh, this will also be shared uh, with you and will be available uh, on the FAO eLearning Academy. Uh, I would like now to ask Fabio to maybe um, um, share with us some of the questions that were posed by participants and see uh, who of you is, is willing to, uh, to respond. Fabio, can you please share some of the questions? Sure. So, Christina, I would, um, I would like to share a question that was addressed by our colleague, Pilar Santa Coloma, to Carmen. Um, so the question is, uh, has WFP followed impact evaluation on changes in children's nutritional status and producer income level? If so, you could shortly describe what has been the result so far. What is the time frame to reach substantial changes in the two indicators? That's the question. You can also see it in case um, directly from the Q&A box. Uh, so uh, Carmen, if you want to have a look, it's, it's there. Yep, thank you so much for that, for that question. And uh, I, I should say that we have a number of impact evaluations that were done actually with the partners here in the call, especially PCD and GCNF and others. 
uh, impact evaluations done of the programs in Ghana, done of the program in Kenya. I believe we also have another really interesting one of the program in Mali and others. And as we move forward, uh, we're going to be looking at doing a meta-analysis of all of these impact evaluations to see how and what we can claim it, it, the evidence is telling us are the are the uh, the benefits of these programs in aggregate now that we have quite a body of research that has been put forward. So let me tell you that the, the evidence is telling us quite conclusively that these programs have an impacts on education dimensions. There is really no discussion anymore about the impact of home girls school feeding on enrollment, attendance, reducing dropout and having a specific benefit for girls. And uh, these are girls of all ages, but also as we move forward in the, in the, in the knowledge base, we're also detecting a specific benefit for adolescent girls um, as well. So the education dimension has been fairly well studied. There's also really good um, evidence that these programs have nutritional benefits. And here through two major pathways, one is by providing them with the more nutritious foods, especially if foods are fortified or biofortified or combined with fortification or supplementation the programs can reduce anemia. And we have this documented as well with a specific focus again on girls. So you can see a gender um, narrative here forming. These, these are programs that are very, very good for gender equality and, and um, they're very gender sensitive if they're designed correctly. But also we're starting to see in more middle income countries and this is an area where research still needs to be done, uh, but we're starting to see some evidence that these programs have benefits on dietary habits of children and the potential benefit around overweight and obesity and malnutrition issues, particularly in middle income countries, but more and more in low income countries. And here, the benefits of homegrown school feeding with the introduction of fresh produce of products that are produced locally is a really important factor, not just to influence what kids eat at, at, in the school, but also their habits and what they take with them later in life. So there's, there's evidence, but still we need to continue to build that knowledge there. But I would say that's a really promising aspect. And then of course, all of the, um, the homegrown aspect that we've been discussing, the impact on smallholder farmers, the impact of local economies, the impact on, on women's employment. And I think it's really important to notice that when we started this idea of homegrown school feeding, we focused mainly on the impact that they would have on farmers and their incomes. But as we have moved forward and studying the practice, we've realized that the benefits range in the supply chain from production to processing, to trading, to the logistics networks, caterers, et cetera. So there are benefits around employment, income, and other things that have been documented um, but specifically in these impact evaluations that I've been talking about in, in Ghana, in Kenya, Mali, there's PCT has done interesting work in Nigeria as well. So th that's a, a little bit of the summary of some of the things that we know so far. Thank you so much, Carmen. It was a very comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, we have two more minutes, so perhaps we can answer to one more question, which is a bit more open. It's from Raffaele Danolfo, and the question is the following. Are the farming systems adopted by smallholders important when talking about homegrown school feeding? Agroecological farming systems can represent an alternative approach to boost the diversification of production with a special emphasis on local crops. So this is for any of you who can uh, take this question as it's not indicated for who's uh, the question. Okay, so I can give you some examples there. And Thank so- you. In, in um, Nigeria, the, the forward contracting system has, has led to the accessibility of, of the markets in a sustainable way to smallholder farmers. So they have this smallholder farmer market now for school feeding. What that's led to is they are now enabled to look at new markets and so I, I know that the, the farmers in, in Nigeria, in a particular state, Oshun state, are now the, the lead suppliers for chicken, for Kentucky fried chicken across Africa. 
And so this started with Sub-Saharan Africa. This started with school feeding. And so here's a stable forward contracting market where you know where the money's coming from. You can you can sign your name. There's nothing on 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 the. It's not a corrupted chain, and so now they they're they're exploring that and they're working on it. The same is true in Mali. And if you look at Mali, Mali had a coup d'état, and the 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 school the school feeding actually survived the coup d'état but it did it in a way that they made it themselves. So when we were talking about context means everything, it's just what can we as technical people engage with governments to act, when they want our help to actually give them the evidence to make it work in their context. So it's working in Mali, it's working in Kenya, it's working in Nigeria, it's working in Madagascar, it's working in several, Ethiopia, it's working all over the place, but it's all context driven. And my, my, my opinion on this is that we need as technical scientific people to be able to give the evidence and allow the politicians and the policymakers and the program implementers to use that information to work it, make it work for them. Okay, thanks a lot for your answer. Uh, since we reached uh, the conclusion of uh, this webinar, let me also remind you that the Q&A comprehensive with all the answers to the questions that have been entered in the box uh, will be provided in and that will be shared in the link that I'm now writing into the chat. So I will give the floor again to Christina for, for closing. Thank you, thank you very much. So I would like to thank um, all the speakers for the excellent presentations. Uh, I would like to also thank all our partners who have made this, uh, this uh, webinar um, possible. So also Agrinium and UNSCAP, uh, Fabio Picinic and uh, Bucare, um, Aristide Bucare for, for, um, for all the, the logistics and all of you, the participants. Thank you very, very much. All the information related to the webinar, the recordings, the PowerPoints, the question and answer will be available through the FAO eLearning Academy on the webinar section. And we look forward to having you with us in our next webinar next Wednesday. Thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you speakers. It was a pleasure.